Hello. Happy Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Nice to have you here. My name is Daniel Namod. I am really looking forward to sharing some things with you tonight in honor not only of Dr. King, but also his daughter, who I was fortunate enough to know a little bit and to work with uh, a little bit, Yolanda, his oldest daughter, who passed away um, too soon, about uh, 15 years ago now, uh, but whom I still remember fondly. Maybe we can never house the homeless Rid the streets of violence and crime Make the world a safe place for our children But we can try Maybe we can never feed the hungry Chase every war plane from the sky Do away with ignorance and hatred Oh yeah, sometimes I feel so helpless, cause all I can do is my best, but even the longest journey begins with a single step, maybe we won't always find forgiveness, or give our wildest dreams the wings to fly. Always love our neighbors, but we can try. Oh, Rather than um, recite some basic facts about Dr. King, uh, I thought I would share some of his words that are somewhat less famous, I think. Uh, the man uh, was such a brilliant writer and speaker, and um, so I thought I'd share some, some uh, anecdotes, some stories in his own words. This is uh, as he's describing his, his uh, childhood. My mother confronted the age-old problem of the Negro parent in America. How to explain discrimination and segregation to a small child. She taught me that I should feel a sense of somebodyness, but that on the other hand, I had to go out and face a system that stared me in the face every day saying, you are less than, you are not equal to. She told me about slavery and how it ended with the Civil War. She tried to explain the divided system of the South as a social condition rather than a natural order. She made it clear that she opposed this system and that I must never allow it to make me feel inferior. Then she said the words that almost every Negro hears before he can yet understand 
the injustice that makes these words necessary. You are as good as anyone. At this time, he says, mother had no idea that the little boy in her arms would, years later, be involved in a struggle against the system she was speaking of. Another uh, excerpt from Dr. King's own memoirs. I remember riding with my father one day when he accidentally drove past a stop sign. A policeman pulled up to the car and said, All right, boy, pull over and let me see your license. My father instantly retorted, Let me make it clear to you that you aren't talking to a boy. If you persist in referring to me as boy, I will be forced to act as if I don't hear a word you're saying. Many people, I think, are familiar with, with what turned out to be a pivotal moment in Mahatma Gandhi's life. Gandhi being a, a central source of, of inspiration and philosophical underpinnings for Dr. King's own approach to uh, dismantling and ending segregation in the South, firm but nonviolent social action. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi's, one of his pivotal uh, formative stories was, many of you know, when he, uh, well, he was a lawyer and he bought a ticket, a first class ticket on the train and because he had brown skin, the conductor said, you must go to the to steerage, to the third class uh, car of the train. And he said, I have a first class ticket and this is where I'm going to sit. Uh, and the conductor stopped the train at the next station and kicked Gandhi off the train. And it was a moment that crystallized for him that, uh, that there was a system of injustice in which he lived. It was his reality, whether he accepted it or not. And he set about spending the rest of his life overturning that system and uh, bringing justice to that system. I found it fascinating uh, that Dr. King himself had a not dissimilar experience when he was 14 years old. I've always thought this was one of the most interesting stories that I never heard. I went to high school on the other side of town, he grew up in Atlanta, to the Booker T. Washington High School. I had to get the bus in what was known as the Fourth Ward and ride over to the west side. In those days, rigid patterns of segregation existed on the buses, so Negroes had to sit in the back of buses. Whites were seated in the front, and often if whites didn't get on the buses, those seats were still reserved for whites only, so Negroes had to stand over empty seats. I would end up having to go to the back of that bus with my body, but every time I got on that bus, I left my mind up at the front seat, and I said to myself, one of these days, I'm going to put my body up there where my mind is. When I was 14, I traveled from Atlanta to Dublin, Georgia, with a dear teacher of mine, Mrs. Bradley. I participated in an oratory contest there, and I won the contest. The title of his talk was, the Negro and the Constitution. And here's an excerpt of, of the talk that Dr. King, Little Martin, at 14 gave that night in Dublin, Georgia. We cannot have an enlightened democracy with one great group living in ignorance. We cannot have a healthy nation with one-tenth of the people, ill-nourished, sick, harboring germs of disease which recognize no color lines and obey no Jim Crow laws. We cannot have a nation orderly and sound with one group so ground down and thwarted that it is almost forced into unsocial attitudes and crime. We cannot be truly Christian people so long as we flout the central teachings of Jesus, brotherly love, and the golden rule. 
that's a short excerpt of an amazing speech that he gave to win that contest at the age of 14. Here's continuing in his memoir. That night, Mrs. Bradley and I were on a bus returning to Atlanta. Along the way, some white passengers boarded the bus. Again, this is Martin having just won the contest uh, and holding a prize, I believe, holding a medal, and, um, and having given that specific speech on that subject. Along the way, some white passengers boarded the bus, and the white driver ordered us to get up and give the whites our seats. We didn't move quickly enough to suit him, so he began cursing us. I intended to stay right in that seat, but Mrs. Bradley urged me up, saying we had to obey the law. We stood up in the aisle for 90 miles to Atlanta. That night will never leave my memory. It was the angriest I have ever been in my life. I am specifically singing songs tonight that Yolanda liked. This is another song that I sang when she and I worked together. I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. When I watch the news, it makes me cry for all of the anger I see. So many souls believing the lie that hatred is all they can be. So I take the chance to offer my prayer, to whisper the truth. And I believe today is the day that my message gets through. Useless to try. So 
so futile to dream. But remember, the power of creation lies in what we Everyone is born with God's name. That was uh, one of Yolanda's favorite songs of mine. A song called God's Name. I'd like to read a little bit more of Dr. King's amazing writing. Um, this uh, this is uh, from uh, a famous a famous uh, letter uh, that he wrote from the Birmingham jail. He wrote it to local clergy that had criticized uh, his social action that he was leading. And um, this is an amazing bit of writing, and it'll segue it'll it'll segue us into a little discussion of Yolanda as well. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins and marches and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're quite right in calling for negotiation. This is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community is forced to confront the issue. My citing the creation of tension as part of my work may sound rather shocking, but I must confess I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension, which is necessary for growth. I'm skipping ahead. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. Wait has almost always meant Never. We have waited. This is one of the more amazing paragraphs I have ever read. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. We still creep at horse and buggy pace towards gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter, Yolanda, why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and you see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told 
that fun town is closed to colored children. And you see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When you are living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next and are plagued with inner fear and outer resentment when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, he says to the clergy in Birmingham, I hope you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. oldest child. In fact, she never quite liked her name. She always thought it was a little formal and uh, settled on a nickname, Yoki. Um, I'm sure I never called her Yoki, uh, but I, I imagine her close family called her Yoki, the way my family still calls me Danny, um, family and, and friends. Um, she was born just a few weeks before Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus, 1955. Um, that story of Fun Town is true, uh, that uh, she was distraught that she wasn't able to go to the new amusement park. 
when she was seven, she heard her father refer to her and her siblings, three siblings, younger siblings, in the I Have a Dream speech when he said, my four children. Uh, Yolanda was the oldest. She was seven. And she was 12 when her father was murdered in Memphis. She had, uh, at the time, it was observed by many, she had extraordinary poise as a 12-year-old, uh, comforting her mother, Coretta, uh, and, and caring for her younger siblings. Um, she was uh, mature beyond her years. She did not see a lot of her father in those 12 years before he died. She loved him, and, uh, and he was good to his kids as she remembered it, but uh, he was busy, right? Um, Yolanda uh, looked like her daddy, and I can say that firsthand, and it was a little stunning and striking to be in her presence and see her father's face in hers. And let me tell you real briefly how I met Yolanda, because I really think it actually says uh, something really impressive and beautiful about her. Um, I was uh, walking through the airport in San Jose, I'm pretty sure. This is around 2004, maybe. And I uh, walked through the bookstore in the airport, and there was a book, a softcover book, paperback. And it was called Open My Eyes, Open My Soul by, e, by Yolanda King and Elodia Tate. And I opened this book, and it was beautiful. There were stories. Uh, remembrances of civil rights marches and movements and protests and uh, essays from uh, more contemporary uh, folks. And it was a beautiful book and it's, it was published um, by um, McGraw-Hill, but it was also, I want to get the uh, name of her production company, oh yeah, Higher Ground Productions was the name of her production company. She had a, a vision for her work um, that uh, to give you an idea, her uh, Higher Ground Productions, the mission of it was a gateway for inner peace, unity, and global transformation. Her art was not becoming a minister, which was actually a real departure for her family. Um, I have a, a funny, you know, funny, but kind of a fun, fun, kind of a funny little quote uh, from Dr. King, and he was the he was the pastor, co-pastor actually at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, which is now the, the church where the current just elected Senator Raphael Warnock comes is, is the pastor. Um, but uh, this, this is uh, what, what uh, Dr. King said about becoming a preacher. I grew up in the church. My father is a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. My great-grandfather was a preacher. My only brother is a preacher. My daddy's brother is a preacher. So I didn't have much choice. Yolanda did not become a preacher. Yolanda was an actor, a performer, a presenter. Uh, she, had a, um, she had a regal bearing about her. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person who felt like I was in the presence of a noble woman, if that makes sense. Um, beautiful face powerful bearing, clear voice, thoughtful demeanor. She thought before she spoke, and she spoke beautifully and clearly, performed beautifully, appeared on television shows, produced movies about her father and other things. Um, but she was never a preacher. And she did grow up uh, feeling uh, like she was in the shadow of uh, an, an overwhelming legacy of her father and mother, uh, who she absolutely considered uh, partners and collaborators in the civil rights work they did. Uh, so I'm looking at this book, Open My Eyes, Open My Soul, and it's beautiful. And I'm going around the country singing One Power in God's name, and we can try. And I'm thinking, these two women, Yolanda and Elodia, they would, I think they'd really appreciate my songs. Um, so I contacted them. I think it was through Elodia. And the contact was, 
I'd love to send you some music because I think you both will appreciate these songs because they really are in alignment with what your book is about, what your mission is about. And frankly, I think, I think we could present together. You, the two of you speak, act, you know, do monologues, read from your book, and I sing songs in between. Uh, and something amazing happened. Uh, they wrote back and said yes, Yolanda and Elodia. And um, we performed together in the San Diego area and did an evening exactly as I had hoped, uh, where these two impressive, powerful, you know, talented, charismatic women read from their book and, and spoke about their lives and how they knew each other and I interspersed with songs. I had plans for more than more than one event, and they didn't pan out, and I don't really remember why. Um, but uh, Elodie and I stayed in touch a bit, Yolanda and I stayed in touch, and actually um, the last time I saw her was on a train. It was something called a peace train. It was an event in, I think, 2007 most likely 2007, maybe 2006. And Yolanda and I had a good long conversation. It was wonderful. And we talked actually about working on a musical together. We talked about uh, creating, writing uh, a, 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 a longer piece. Um, she actually, one, one interesting thing about her work was she actually worked for years with uh, Malcolm X's daughter. Her, her name was Atala Shabazz. Uh, Malcolm's uh, original name is Shabazz, actually taken name, I believe. Um, and uh, his daughter worked with Yolanda, and they performed hundreds of times uh, all over the country. She worked at the uh, Dr. King Center in Atlanta. She taught as a professor at Fordham University. But I think her first love was performing. And not surprisingly, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, performing just anything. It was performing uh, drama with a heart and a soul and a message. Um, it was really uh, special to be in her presence in Yolanda's, and Elodia's too, but I'm talking about Yolanda tonight. Uh, but it was really special to be in Yolanda's presence. She uh, was gracious and kind and, like I said, clear. Um, and one of the things, it's going to sound maybe random, but you'll understand, I think, um, Sometimes, maybe you feel this way too, sometimes you meet a grown-up, quote-unquote, who, whose face is so adorable, like they have a baby face in some way, that, that you have an affectionate feeling towards them right away. You can imagine them. In my mind, anyway, I can sometimes imagine somebody has a baby face and just think, they must have looked just the same when they were two. Oh my God, look at that face. And, and I felt like, maybe because I'd seen photos of Yolanda as a little girl, um, but uh, I felt like I, I felt like I could I felt like I could feel not only this p powerful, beautiful, you know, talented woman, you know, a part a, and a piece of American history, a precious, right, irreplaceable piece of American history, her family, and I also felt like I was in the presence of a little girl who had lost her daddy. I couldn't, I couldn't get that out of my mind. Not that, not only who her daddy was, but simply that this was a little girl who had lost her daddy. And um, I was reading over some material about her, and I wasn't the only person uh, who, who perceived maybe a note of that sadness, right, um, inside, in the presence, obviously, of, like I said, someone with with, with, who was making a real contribution and was a really uh, lit up performer. Um, but I still was aware of that. Um, and um, I am sure I'm far from the only person, therefore, who felt inherently an extra few percent of kindness and compassion towards her. No, no pity, but just I was aware working with Yolanda that this is someone who, as a little girl, had had her heart broken and her world shattered that way. Um, on that train ride in 2007, 
Uh, she told me how hard she was working going through her mother Coretta's papers. She said her mother died with a room full of papers covering her bed, covering every surface in her room, and she uh, and her mother had just died the year before, and she spent every waking hour, she was exhausted from the effort. In fact, when we talked about writing something together on that train ride, she uh, said, it's gonna have to wait until I finish going through my mother's papers because I'm donating them. I don't know where they were ending up, what library they were going to, uh, but her papers were being organized to be donated as a collection. And she said, uh, she said when I'm done with those papers, let's do this. Um, and that was exciting, of course, uh, because of the regard with which I held her. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things also that I was um, filled up with, and this is, let me sing you another song that I sang that night uh, working with her. One of the feelings that I couldn't shake, wouldn't want to shake, uh, was, and this, is, this sentence isn't for name dropping, it's just true. Is, is the same feeling I had when I sang for, or in the presence of, uh, Arun Gandhi and his wife. Arun being Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, who was uh, traveling at the time and speaking beautifully, of course. Uh, and he looked like his grandfather a little bit. Uh, he had lived with his grandfather for some years at the ashram where my friend Nemo uh, now lives. And... Um, and Arun and his wife, whose name I cannot remember, and I wish I could, because she was an amazing woman, beautiful woman, uh, they loved my music. And especially they loved this song I'm about to sing, as did Yolanda. And working with Yolanda in advance, planning the events, and then performing with her, and then staying in touch with her after, you know what I couldn't help but feel? I couldn't help but feel like if a Gandhi and a king believe what my songs purport, like believe the message of my music, then I, Danny, am on the right side of history. And I have held on to that knowledge. It's very important to me, that knowledge, that I sing songs that are niche songs, they're not famous, they're not hits on the radio, I'm not a millionaire from this. There's never been a pathway that I've been able to find to, you know, fame and fortune from it. But Arun and his wife loved my songs, and Dr. King's eldest daughter loved my songs. And I must be doing something right. I don't know if that sounds strange or... <laughs> or egotistical, but I have held on to that realization um, at times when I've wondered what the hell I was doing and why. I sometimes remember the Gandhis and the Kings like what you do. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord, call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, angels' wings, or heaven's door, but whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the power of the love in you and me. One power, yeah. So many languages, different clothing, different colors, different names. But different is only dangerous when we forget that in the heart we're all the same. We'll remember once we close our eyes to see. That such distances were never meant to be. Call it God, call it Spirit, or Jesus, or Lord. Call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, Hashem, or Heaven's door. It's Muhammad, it's 
It's your mind, it's your soul, it's your sign. It's the universe, it's music, Mother Earth or Father Time. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? Whatever name you give it, it's the very air we breathe. It's the power of the love. In 2007, she died suddenly. I believe she was 51. Uh, she died uh, of a heart attack and uh, in Santa Monica. And I remember uh, hearing the news uh, on the radio, I think, and just couldn't believe it. And now can't even believe it more when I think that I'm 50. She was one year older than I am when she died far, far too soon. I don't talk much about, you know, my experiences with, um, with certain people. It's just no call to, but, but I felt like it was, I felt like it was a good day to talk about Yolanda. She said yes to working with a total stranger, not famous. I offered nothing but, uh, a kindred spirit. I offered nothing but, uh, sincerity. And she was gracious and generous and open enough with all that she'd been through to say yes. And it blew me away then and it blows me away now. Um, so rest in peace, Yolanda. Rest in peace, Dr. Martin. Uh, I want to close with one more reading and uh, one more song. It is uh, an amazing moment. I think in American history, uh, when um, Dr. King was killed, shot on that balcony in that uh, hotel in Memphis, where I've been actually, uh, word spread that Dr. King was gone. John F. Kennedy had already been killed. Uh, Bobby Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, was uh, a leader and a rising star and uh, was... Uh, was to run for president and himself be uh, killed soon thereafter. But uh, Robert Kennedy stood in front of a crowd. I want to say it was in Boston, but actually I don't remember for sure. 
spontaneously stood in front of a crowd, uh, spoke to them, and started by saying, a terrible thing has happened. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed tonight. And you can hear immediate gasps and then sobbing and shouting. And as far as I know uh, and remember, this was uh, spontaneous speaking. It was off the cuff, in the moment. He had no, no advance warning, of course, and no time to prepare remarks. So Robert Kennedy stood up in front of a crowd that had just received the news that Dr. King was gone. And here are some of his words. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. We can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country, in great polarization, black people amongst black, white people amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that has spread across our land with an effort to understand with compassion and love. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. So I ask you tonight to return home to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King. But more importantly, to say a prayer for our country, which all of us love. A prayer for understanding and compassion. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past. We will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness. It is not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings who abide in our land. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. I want to thank you for joining me tonight and I want to uh, close with a song that pays tribute to and excerpts uh, probably the most famous uh, civil rights anthem sung back then by all kinds of people. I'd like to think that I would have been there uh, with a guitar uh, doing what I could. I have no way of knowing, of course, so here I am today doing what I can. And um, I know that you are where you are doing what you can do. And that is, in fact, all that we can do. So. Uh, Dr. King and Yolanda and so many others, we thank you for your memory and for your uh, extraordinary courage and wisdom uh, and uh, example. All right, thank you again. One more song.
burning inside, the hurting and the suffering minds Creating anger, fear and pain, suffocating our times The tougher it gets, the rougher social media cries But we see to it that we tweet and only negative lines We're sick and tired of history, but repeating it twice Greed, anger and violence, clearly stealing our nights Feeling it tight between the shoulders with a chill in the spine Pinching myself, waking up, trying to stop the rewind And move forward towards stories, overcoming our fears Choosing love over hate, praying, trading hugs over tears There's only one choice, breaking down the walls and repair Every broken heart on this planet till there's no longer fear Walls can't hold us in Fear can't keep us down Love will rise again Yeah, it's rising right now We shall overcome Every time I think it's gonna take much longer we shall overcome Every time I question them I get in stronger We have just begun We're gonna make a change we gotta push much farther We shall overcome We shall overcome We shall overcome Whoa, whoa, whoa. We shall overcome We shall overcome Young Gandhi couldn't fathom how to deal with himself When he was thrown off the train and the pain that he felt Mrs. Parks disrespected, dragged into jail Cause of the color of his skin, organs, tissues and cells One day a young girl was shot on a bus by a man A terrorist, part of the Taliban He said, on this land you have no right to stand for What you believe in, girls have no chance here Well now, that's just the story of three souls Who shook our planet after being down on their knees And it's not gonna stop, those seeds have now become trees And this human being We'll keep on digging till we find peace Yeah, the cynics always say That nothing ever changes The human nature's bound to stay the same But it couldn't be more plain That violence never pays Injustice never stays It's bound to fade away What if history awaits? What if today's the day? So let's all lead the way We shall overcome Every time I think it's gonna take much longer We shall overcome Every time I question them I get in stronger We have just begun we gonna make a change, we gotta push much farther We shall overcome We shall overcome, come on
Thanks for being on the right side of history. Sleep well. I'll talk to you very soon. Good night.